It has been a delight to go to quite a few graduation open houses in the last little while, and I've seen many of you there present as well. It's been good to honor your accomplishments. It's been nice to see you at one another's open houses. It's just something nice about seeing the people of God together celebrating the goodness of God in what he is building. Because I go to these graduation open houses and I see more than just a graduation open house. I see a spiritual house being built. You see it with me, those who have attended? You get to see these young men and women rejoicing with one another and growing up with one another and the impact of brothers and sisters in Christ and the impact they've had on their lives and the celebration all together. It's the way it should be in the church of Jesus Christ. I have a confession to make this morning. You're actually getting, I should have made this two sermons. You're getting two sermons for the price of one. Grown now, grown now. But you're getting two sermons for the price of one. If anybody decides to give extra after that second sermon, I just want to encourage you. Arlen Palmer will match double the dollars that you give. No, 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 no. That's when you say amen. Selective supporter. I tell you, <clears throat> what do you say we just dig into it? You ready? Father, govern our hearts and minds and remove, remove the baggage so that we delight in you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Together, I want us to huddle around the Word, listen to what the Spirit of Christ has to say through the Word of Christ to the body of Christ so that we delight in the Word of God written and we delight in the living Word of God. So that we delight in the Word of God written and we delight in our Lord Jesus Christ. That sounds like two wonderful goals, doesn't it? Here we go. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. For those who will be preachers, next time just do verses 1 through 3, and then do verses 4 through 8 as a separate sermon. So, put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, rather, like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will never be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Delight in the word of God written. Verses 1 through 3. Delight in the word of God written. We have just come out of the end of 1 Peter chapter 1 where it, told, where it told us that we have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. Well, what is that? 
Well, through the living and the abiding Word of God. The Word of the Lord remains forever. And then that explanatory phrase at the end, this Word is the good news that was preached to you. Everybody with me at the end of chapter 1. So we left our study. We come then to the so in chapter 2, verse 1. So, on account of this, you need to delight in the Word of God written. The Word of God is necessary for our growth in salvation. We're blessed in Grand Rapids. We are. We've got all kinds of publishing houses. Scholars from all over the world at noon get on their knees and face toward Grand Rapids and bow and pray (laughs) with thanksgiving for all the Christian publishing houses that we have here in West Michigan. You think I'm kidding. I think some of them do. But we give thanks for that. No Christian book has been written that has the power of the Word of God. The best Christian book or books that have ever been written pale. They aren't even of the same character or quality of the Word of God. Is it good to read books on theology and helps in Bible. Yes. Yes. Some of you are disgusted when you walk into my offices. I get it. How many of those of you actually read at least 80% of every book that is on my shelf has been read? Most of them fully. Why? Because I think it's important. I don't just study on behalf of me. I study on behalf of the church. I read things that you're not going to have time to read in order to understand some things and and try to bring and shed some light on some things that we can understand and learn together. But if that study, if any of that study becomes more important than listening to what the Spirit of Christ has to say through the Word of Christ to the body of Christ I should no longer be a pastor. And I'm dead serious about that. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it, you, second person plural, you collectively may grow up You can mature in this salvation. The Word of God is necessary for our growth and salvation. Again, there's no secret pill. It is the study, the engagement, and the faithful, growing, joyous obedience to the Word that matures us in the faith and the salvation that we've been granted by the grace of God. Delight in the Word of God because it is essential for our growth and salvation. Delight in the Word of God written, because the Word of God written is pure. Isn't that a beautiful word? It's pure. It is not the milk that the people in the market would take the milk and add water to it. They'd get more money because they spread that milk out over Jug after jug after jug after jug. But it wouldn't be pure milk. It would be cheapened. It would be lessened. There's an inherent danger of our living that, of my preaching that of our churches engaging that kind of ministry. That in order somehow we think to make the Word of God more palatable to people, that we will dilute it and try to even protect it when it says things that are uncomfortable for us. 
let the Word of God say what it says in order that we might hear what it says for our nourishment, for our growth into salvation, so that we might live in love the way God has designed for us to live in love. And when it has to chip away at us and remove what God does not want to see in us, let us allow the Holy Spirit to have the written Word of God's full work in our lives so that the orientations of our heart would be rightly directed, so that our choices and our wills would be changed for the glory of God, so that our minds would think the thoughts of God after him. The word of God is pure. Like newborn infants long for the pure milk. Don't dilute it. Don't settle for cheap substitutes. Listen to what the Spirit of Christ is saying through the Word of Christ. The Word of God makes sense. I know some are saying, have have you read some stuff? Yep. The Word of God makes sense. That's that word spiritual. Long for the pure spiritual milk. Here, Logicon, when you read it in Romans chapter 12, you you want to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God because this is your, some of your texts read spiritual act of worship. Uh, Some of it reads reasonable service, right? It is Logicos. It makes sense sense, given all that God has done for us, and the ministry and the person, the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, please understand when it says, you long for the pure spiritual milk, think of 1 Corinthians 2 here. It makes sense. Now, the Word of God is not going to make sense to an unredeemed person who has not been given the Holy Spirit because spiritual things are discerned by the Holy Spirit. But you, we, those of us who are embracing Jesus as Savior and Lord, have been given the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, and this spiritual milk makes sense sense because of the Holy Spirit who is within us, who causes us to delight in this word, and we hear his voice, the one who is the primary consistent author of all of Holy Scripture, the very word that he constituted as the word of God. Isn't that beautiful? Long for that, long for this pure, spiritual, it makes sense, this pure, spiritual Word of God that nourishes us just like a mother's milk does for newborn infants. Peter here He's not making the distinction between milk for babies and growing into meat, like Paul does in in another area. He's not doing that here. He's talking about the Word of God as this pure spiritual milk. And that, that milk, that milk that nourishes a baby, everybody in the house who has been around a newborn infant knows exactly the imagery that is being promoted here, right? I remember it in our home, and I had since forgotten it. And then our children began having children, and I was reminded once again, and I was reminded of how thankful I was that they were my grandchildren. (laughs) Amen, grandparents? Yeah. I forgot the immediacy of 
I don't have milk. I want milk. I need milk. I'm going to get milk. (laughs) Everybody in the house with me? Why? Because I've got to have it. I can't live without it. I need it now. I I can't, I'm not sustained without it. I I, I need this this milk. I, I need it badly. I don't care who I have to tell to let them know. I I need this milk. I don't care where I am. I don't care what the circumstances are. I don't care if I'm in public. I don't care if I'm in private. I'm not ashamed to say I'm in desperate need of this milk or I will die. Now it's time to do a heart and a gut check. Does that really characterize our lives? I want it. I need it. I've got to have it, and I don't care who knows about it. I don't care if I'm in public. I don't care if I'm in private. I can't live without it. Without it, I will die. How many copies of the Bible do you have? Out of all the copies of the Bible that you have, how many copies have you opened this past week? Out of the number of copies that you opened this past week, how often did you come to it longing, yearning, expecting to hear from the Holy Spirit, anticipating hearing a word from God. How much time did you spend in those copies of the Bible that you have looking and studying, looking at individual words and just delighting in some of those words that are there? Looking at a particular word and saying, That is a very cool word, and I have no idea what it means. But because I want to know, I'm going to look that word up. I'm going to see if that word is used in other places in Scripture, too, so that I can understand perhaps a little bit more of what it says. And then I'm going to read back a little bit and read forward a little bit, because the context is even going to help me understand what that word means. And I... I need this. I need to know. I'm in the midst of making decisions, and I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It, it's not that I expect chapter and verse on the particular decision that I'm making. I'm not even sure that I'm thinking rightly about it, though. And I know the Word of God can help me in framing my understanding of how to think rightly. 
The Word of God even helps me to better frame the questions that I have about circumstances and situations. How much time have I spent in those copies of the Word of God that I did happen to open during the course of this past week to hear a word from the Spirit? How often did I give myself not to go into the text in order to tell the text what I already knew about it, but to hear to listen and to receive from the Word of God what I needed in order to live this week. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed, you have truly tasted that the Lord is good. How do we approach the Word of God correctly with hearts oriented to learn and to grow? Chapter 2, verse 1 starts us off negatively, right? Negatively, put off all of these kinds of relational sins that, are, that have gripped your heart and mind that, that cause you to come to the Word with wrong motives. Or get rid of, put off these spiritual, relational sins that disallow you that keep you because you're consumed with circumstances that have to do with other people in relation to yourself, so that keeps you from coming to the Word of God at all. You want to long for, yearn for, delight in the Word of God written, And by God's grace and for his glory, let's remove those relational sins that keep us away from him, away from this word of God written. Put away all malice. That's a that's a mean sounding word, isn't it? It's good that it's a mean sounding word because it's a mean thing. Malice. Have you ever been out to get someone? Well, Pastor Halstead, I would never. I didn't didn't ask if you acted it out. (laughs) See, I know I could say, have any of you acted out malice? Have you done things, activities with malicious intent? I still think the vast majority of us would raise our hands with our heads bowed, and say, well, (laughs) but if I said, what about those who don't have their hands raised, and we just talked about the orientation of the heart and the mind, and I don't believe any one of us would escape. Malicious intent where I want In the name of justice. May God receive glory and his destruction of this particular person. In Jesus' name. (laughs) Amen. Some of us have been there. Do you know how hard it is to come to the Word of God and read texts where Jesus is telling us? They will know us by our love. When that's the orientation of our heart and mind? Let this mind of Christ be in you. Ugh. We see the Lord Jesus Christ 
On the night when he was betrayed, take a basin of water and a cloth. The one who spoke all creation into existence. And he washes the dirty feet of people like you and me. And he says, as you've seen me do, you should do this to one another also. It is hard to come to the Word of God when malicious intent is in our hearts and minds. Amen? So by God's grace and for His glory, let it be removed. Deceit. Deceit. I grew up with parents who hate deceit. And it's instilled in me a hate for deceit and lying. I believe I've told you this before. I would tell my children, I know, I know that you are going to do things in disobedience to God and to us. I know that. And I, as your father, am giving you some freedom here. While you're still in our house, I'm giving you some freedoms even to fail. Because you're still safe here. And I don't care what it is you have done. I don't care what it is you have said. But you always need to tell me the truth. Don't try to protect yourself. Don't try to protect others. Do not. Do not try to deceive me. I guarantee you, I will find out if I don't already know. Do not lie to me. Because you know what happens with lies and deceit? Brianna, Jeffrey, you are under mom and dad's umbrella of provision and protection. And as long as we're all working with the same information and you tell me the truth, I will walk with you through anything. But as soon as you lie, you step outside of the umbrella of that provision and protection. And because I do not have truthful information, I can no longer protect you. And I can no longer provide for you. You know how destructive that is for a family? You know how destructive that is for a church family? Let deceit be far from us. Let hypocrisy, in fact, in the Greek, this is plural, hypocrisies. This is like many masks, depending on who you're with. You're one person on Sunday. Monday, you look very different, depending on the context of the people that you're with. You talk differently when you're in a locker room with the guys than what you do when you're at church and giving an answer to your student ministries leader. You talk differently when you're in the workplace and the jokes that you tell than the jokes you would tell if you were out in the hallway talking with brother or sister in Christ. The things that you're seeking after and motivated by during the work week look different than the things that you're telling people that you're motivated by when you participate in the gathering of the saints. Hypocrisies. Usually one of two things happens. We function very much like the person in James who comes to the Word of God, not longing, not yearning, not anticipating, looks at the Word of God, reads the Word of God as a mirror, puts it down, marks off that he's looked at the Word of God or she's looked at the Word of God, walks away and forgets what they look like. 
forgets what manner of person they truly are. So I do my deal, but the Word of God has no impact on my life in the changing of my heart, the changing of my mind, the changing of my choices. Or there are hypocrisies to the point where I will never even bring myself to open this Word because I know I will be faced with the very things that I am trying so desperately to suppress in my own unrighteousness that I don't even want to see it. I don't want to read it because I cannot bear it. By God's grace and for his glory, no more hypocrisies. Amen, church? Let it be removed. Envy. Oh, how I want what somebody else has or who somebody else is. We can't rejoice with those who rejoice. We can't praise God for blessings that other people have. If he has not at least blessed us in same measure or preferably greater measure. That is contrary to who God has made us to be. When you are stuck with envying other people for what they have or who they are, you are looking at the face of God and saying, what you have given me and done for me is not enough. When you're saying that to your father, you don't want to hear a word from your father. Because you know, you can open up the word of your father at any place and he'll begin by saying, really, Jeff? I haven't done enough for you. I haven't provided you enough, really. You were my enemy. I made you my son. And my one and only son died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin. And you're complaining because you don't think this person deserves that kind of car while you're driving this kind of car? That's the complaint you're bringing to me? Seriously. You know what envy leads to? The very next word. Slander. In order to make myself feel better about where I am, I am very likely to slander those people that I wish I had what they had, or did what they did. You know how they got that stuff anyway, don't you? Have you heard? Well, let me tell you. I publicly thank God that I'm not like them getting things in the way that they're getting them, although I really wish that I had the things that they had. Boy, we can be messed up people. Amen? <laughs> oh, man. Not that any of you have ever experienced any of these things. We're just talking about other people and other people's problems. Or maybe some change needs to happen right here. Negatively, Put off malice, deceit, hypocrisies, envy, slander, and positively reflect on the goodness of God. Just reflect on the goodness of God. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, 
than long for, yearn for, delight in the Word of God written. Read it, study it, reflect upon it, and obey it with joy. Delight in the Word of God written. Sermon 2. Delight in the living Word of God. Delight in the living Word of God, verses 4 through 8. Okay. What's going on in the big picture? The big picture is this. Hold on. This is exciting. God is building a spiritual house. Everybody with me so far? God is building a spiritual house for His glory and our blessing. That's enough. Hallelujah. Amen. He is building a spiritual house made with living stones. That's us. Christians, believers, followers of Jesus. He's building a spiritual house made with living stones who have come to and surrendered to the one who is the chief living stone, who is the true cornerstone, namely, Jesus. Okay, that's the big picture. So let's talk about the spiritual house made with living stones. That's us. Those of us who are embracing Jesus as Savior and Lord, who have been born again, the language used in 1 Peter 1, who have been born again, made new creations in Jesus Christ, received the ministry of the Holy Spirit, who have been brought to life by, sustained by, and nourished by the Word of God. Okay. These stones, but just for clarity, we just said it, but we're going to try to clarify it again. These stones, each of us who are embracing Jesus, only have life because we have come to the true living stone who has offered life to us. We were dead stones. He made us living stones as we came to him. So the living stone gave us life in the first place. All God's people should be saying something. I want to say something else here because this is very significant. These stones don't have These stones don't have significance as a spiritual house when they lay on their own. Right? Something very instructive here. These stones don't have significance as a spiritual house when they lay on their own, but only as they are placed together in their proper place in relation to the chief cornerstone, who is Jesus. There is something of great significance in what God is building in us together. It's not just a slogan. It's a reality in the biblical text time and time again. Who we are, we are. And what we do, we do. That's the reality. Stones can be pretty on their own. Amen? They can be. Each stone can have a unique contour, some that some of us find pleasing, aesthetically pleasing. Stones, if you're like me, not now because I only think of the pain that it would bring, but you look, if you go to the shore of Lake Michigan, especially up in the north, you look for those smooth stones for skipping. You can imagine why I think and feel the pain. Mm. But those are unique stones. And you find the right one so you can get past 34 skips. Okay? That's the goal. So far that's been the limit. We 
we take a certain level of joy when we find a stone that seems to resemble something, right? There's Elvis at Kmart. I can sell it on eBay. You wonder why our offerings have been so good. (laughs) Just preach, Jeff, just preach. But placed together, these stones placed together, that's where the beauty lies. Can you see the house in your mind's eye? Can you see the house being built? The living stones don't build it. The living stones are what's being used to be placed to build this spiritual house. So you take those stones that are pretty, some that have neat contours, some that might be good for skipping. But placed together, it is remarkable what a beautiful structure can be built when a designer with purpose and beauty in mind begins to place and craft and design, order, and build something that artists can see, that craftsmen can do, that you Lego masters understand when you read a text like this. I despise Legos. Hey, I don't feel bad about saying that at all. And I buy them for my grandchildren so that my children can experience the same pain that I have in the middle of the night by stepping Lord, bless my kids. But I can watch a grandson or a granddaughter take that mess that is on the floor and with an engineering purposed mind, they craft something that's really quite remarkable. And has purpose and design. The girls usually create something of beauty. The boys, something that is very functional. Ideally, a gun that would protrude from Papa's arm thing (laughs) that they think is so cool. (laughs) But think about that in light of the Lord using us as living stones that he has brought to Jesus. And now he's saying, I've had you here for this purpose. And now, I'm going to place you here. And it's going to fit. And it's going to fit beautifully and wonderfully. He's used your background and and your background and my background and He has brought us together in this place, this family, this house for his honor and glory for such a time as this with purpose and beauty in mind. And he's crafting this spiritual house for his glory and our blessing. He builds. He builds us individually for the purpose of our being built together corporately built up as a spiritual house, unified in Christ with the Holy Spirit. I can't help again but think of 1 Corinthians 12, 13. That we've all participated in this baptism of the Holy Spirit so that any spiritual distinctions that could have existed have been removed so that we can all be a part, Jew, Gentile, male, female, rich, poor, educated, uneducated, 
black, white, brown, doesn't matter the color, doesn't matter the background. What matters is that Jesus paid it all and we surrendered to him and he empowered us with the Holy Spirit so that we could live in unity together for the glory of God. He has brought us together for this purpose. He builds, and we have been built as a royal house of priests. What do we do? We offer spiritual sacrifices. We offer sacrifices of praise. We offer lives and lips that proclaim His name, His kingdom, His will, because we are no longer primarily about our own or anyone else's. It is about Him now, and that's why He has placed us together, unified as living stones in this house. And these offering, this offering of spiritual sacrifices are acceptable to God. He receives them with delight. But He receives them with delight not because of the value of the living stones on their own. He accepts them with delight through Jesus Christ, the living stone who has given us life. All of what we do is mediated through Christ. When we discuss the spiritual house made with living stones, let me very quickly, the glory of the chief cornerstone. He's a living stone rejected by men. He has become a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. Think about this in relationship to Jews and Gentiles back in this time. A stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, a living stone. There is no way that Christians should have equal footing with Jews. We have been the people of God. We are the people of God. The covenants were given to us. The promises were given to us. Just in this context, Jesus Christ, salvation, for all who will believe. And everyone, Jew, Gentile, every human being who is redeemed through the shed blood of Jesus Christ is equal at the foot of the cross of Jesus. How can it be? Stone of stumbling, rock of offense. And the text says they were destined for this stumbling, resulting from disobedience. But not only is he a living stone rejected by men, what we need to be concerned about is God's point of view. Amen? And as far as that's concerned, Jesus the Christ is that living stone chosen by God. Jesus Christ is that living stone who is precious. Precious. Worthy of our delight. Worthy of our worship. Worthy of our praise. Worthy of our lives. Regardless of the cost. The cornerstone from which the whole spiritual house will be put together. His name is Jesus. The living stone embraced by those who delight in him and have been redeemed by him. As you look at the text, verse 7, so the honor is for you who believe. What do we mean? Again, the living stone embraced by those who delight in him and have been redeemed by him. We have been honored. By all that Christ is and all that he has done, we receive the honor of being placed into this spiritual house as royal priests. We receive the honor and blessing of salvation offered through the cornerstone named Jesus. We receive the honor of being built together 
We receive the honor of communion with God as a royal house of priests. We receive the honor of offering spiritual sacrifices of praise which God accepts from us through Jesus the Christ. We receive the honor of the gift of faith and repentance forevermore where we recognize our total dependence upon God for everything. We receive the honor of being made living stones as we come to the living stone, the living word, Jesus the Christ, who serves as the cornerstone of the very house he, has, he is building and growing with us. We receive the honor of glorifying our Lord Jesus Christ as we rightly live together as a royal house of priests, bringing people to God and taking God to the people. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Delight in the word of God written. Delight in the living Word of God, Jesus the Christ. God will be honored in his people, and we will forever be blessed. Our Father in heaven, blessed be your name. Oh, how we thank you for salvation in Jesus. Oh, how we thank you for the word written. How we thank you that you have made yourself known through Holy Scripture and your plan and purpose for us through this Holy Scripture. Oh, how we thank you for making yourself known through the living word, Jesus the Christ. Oh, how we thank you for making us living stones to come to the Lord Jesus so that your gracious, skillful hands could take those of us who embrace Jesus as Savior and Lord and make us fit and place us where we are supposed to be in this spiritual house so that all of us mature as one house together for the glory of your name. Remove what Whatever is in our lives that keeps us from this shared mission, deliver us from the evil one so that we might be yours fully in accomplishing this mission until Jesus Christ returns. We give ourselves to continue to delight in your word written and the living word in whose name we pray. Amen. Go in his grace and peace.